Welcome, everybody. That was so much fun. I'm pumped up. Listen, today we're going to talk about understanding your nonprofit financial statements. My name is Aretha Simons. I'm the webinar producer here. I'm going to show you how we can engage in the next slide. There's going to be a survey quickly that's going to pop up when you leave the Zoom. It's just two questions. Please answer it so we can know how to better serve you. Um, put your questions in the chat. Greg's really good about answering them in the chat, but we have team members in the background that answer in the Q&A. Somebody's already turned on the closed caption. So if you need the closed caption, just type on the CC button at the bottom of your screen. I'm going to turn this over to Greg Boston, the founder of, I don't know, I'm always want to claim you the founder of QuickBooks. One day, Greg, one day. QuickBooks yeah. be easy. <laughs> yeah. QuickBooks are not, if I was the founder of QuickBooks, that would mean that I owned into it and I would probably be on a beach somewhere instead of uh, here talking to everybody. But all right. Uh, welcome, everybody, to um, the webinar. Um, in the chat, I want to find out who has seen me teach before. Put it in the chat, either uh, yes, you've seen me teach, or no, you haven't. Uh, who has seen me teach, yes or no? Put it in the chat. Okay, it looks like it's about half and half, so that's kind of cool. Um, I'm really excited about this um, because I usually have to talk about QuickBooks stuff, and I, which I love QuickBooks, but now... I don't have to be in QuickBooks, so it's kind of exciting. So um, if you don't know who I am, it looks like there's a few of you that uh, have not seen me teach before. So I am a CPA, all right? I have an accounting firm in Atlanta, Georgia, although we do books all over the country. We only focus on nonprofit organizations, so we have hundreds of clients that we serve. Um, some of them we do bookkeeping for, some of them we do 990s for, some of them we do audits for. I actually... Um, uh, report on boards of directors. I'll present my audit to the board of directors and I'll spend time explaining how to read an audit to a board of directors that doesn't really know how to read them. Um, and so that's some of what I'm going to do today. It's kind of cool. I haven't done this before uh, in a webinar like this. So I'm pretty excited back. Uh, <laughs> all right. So um, let's see. I also own a company called QuickBooks Made Easy. Let me get this on the screen here for you. Um, and where is QuickBooks Made Easy? Well, I'll just click on it. All right, so go to quickbooksmadeeasy.com. And now QuickBooks Made Easy do is all, all we do is teach nonprofits how to use QuickBooks. We have all kinds of training. We actually have a three-day webinar series, two and a half hours a day that we do twice a year. So it's coming up next month in November. Um, and I'm going to give you a nice big fat discount for coming to that thing. So by the time you get to the end of today... Um, when you will see how you should understand and read your financial statements, you may think to yourself, wait, my organization's financial statements don't look like this at all. So then you might want to send somebody or yourself to come to the class to learn how to get your QuickBooks right. All right. Um, this is our team at QuickBooks Made Easy. Um, Paige Hudson is one of the people on our team. Paige, you want to unmute yourself and say hello? All right. Hello. So and the main reason that I want to tell you that is because right now, if you don't know this, um, you can actually get QuickBooks directly from TechSoup. Uh, and well, I thought I had that here, but I guess I don't. I'm going to go to TechSoup. And if you are using QuickBooks online... Uh, and you're not purchasing it through TechSoup, instead you've got it through Intuit, then you're paying a monthly fee. Um, how many of you are paying a monthly fee for your TechSoup QBO uh, um, subscription? Put yes in the chat if you're paying a monthly fee. We've got 236 people. So all of you people that said that you're paying a monthly fee are wasting money. You're paying at least $100 a month, probably more. You can get from TechSoup going to click on Intuit here. From TechSoup, you can get QuickBooks, the advanced version, which is the one you want to get, for only $170 per year. Only $170 per year. When you click on this to buy QuickBooks uh, from uh, TechSoup, QuickBooks Advanced, we can actually switch you from the one that you're paying a monthly fee on to the one that you just bought here. Um you have to move the data file from the one account to the other. You just have to check this box right here. And when you do that, you'll be set up 
with a, a session to move your data file over and page takes care of that. That's why I wanted to point that out. Okay. Thank you. Kathleen's just commenting in the chat um, that she used it and she thought that it was great. All right. Enough of that. All right. Let's go back here. All right. Um, we'll, we'll move on into that. I want to get to the agenda. Okay. So what we're going to cover is in order for you to understand how to read financial statements for a nonprofit, we need to give you a little bit of a rule about how your financial statements should be structured in your um, accounting accountants records. Okay. Um, and then we're going to tell you how to read a monthly financial that's being presented at a board meeting, how to read your 990 IRS return, and also how to read your audited financial statements. And when I say how to read them, we're going to be telling you what particular things to look for that will both tell you how your organization is doing, as well as what funders are typically looking at so that you can get a good idea of what outside people are going to think about your audit, your 990, and your tax return. Okay, how does that sound to y'all? Is this good? Does this feel like a helpful thing to do? I talk a lot, and then everybody has to answer me in the chat. Otherwise, okay, cool. All right, so here we go. All right. So the first thing that I need to teach you, so listen very, 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 very carefully. In regular businesses, when you write a check, say you have a pizza joint, and you write a check um, for rent, the only thing you really need to worry about is pointing that check to rent, which is what I call the natural category of the expense. So regular businesses have these natural categories Nonprofits have them too. And what those are, those are things like salaries, rent, postage, utilities, office supplies. This is the what of the expense. This is what it's for. And that's one thing. And the only thing that you typically need to track for a for-profit business. Nonprofit businesses, they have to track two, count them, two, two more things for a total of three, okay? They have to track the natural category, but they also need to track the why of the expense. In other words, what specifically was the reason for spending the money on postage? Was it for um, a program or was it for overhead or admin or was it for fundraising? All nonprofits have to put their expenses into those three buckets. Is it a program expense? Is it an admin or overhead expense? Or is it fundraising? All right. So that means that when you or whoever it is that's doing your accounting, when they enter stuff into QuickBooks, and I'm going to go ahead and use QuickBooks online. Uh, I've got to sign into my account, first of all, hold on. Uh, there we go. When they are entering stuff into QuickBooks, they've got to point not just one thing. Every transaction needs to be pointed to at least three things, okay? So I'm just going to show you real quick. Now, we're not going to get into QuickBooks past this, but I just want you to understand because this will come in handy when we start talking about how to read the financials. So let's say whoever's doing the bookkeeping enters a check. They have to put in the natural category, which is the what of the expense right over here. We'll call it, this is the what of the expense, postage. We'll have to put in what program it related to right here. Is it program or is it admin or is it fundraising? Okay. And yes, you can take an individual transaction. It may need to be split between multiple programs, okay? Or pro one for program and one for admin. The third thing that you need to track is what grant paid for it. So if you have grants you're trying to track, we use the customer or project field for that, and you put the name of the grant right there. Now, if you are looking at this going, yeah, this makes sense. This is how our businesses are, our QuickBooks is set up, then you're great. But if it isn't, then you need more training or whoever it is that does your QuickBooks needs more training. Okay. So um, just going to stop for one second. Does anybody have a question about this before we get into what to read on the financial statements? And you'll see how important this is when we start reading the financials. 
Is everybody okay? I'm going to take a sip of water. So no one's saying anything. Oh, Frederica is. Okay. Can you post the slide again? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there it is. There's the grant. Okay. So those are the three things that need to be tracked. All right. And also you will get these slides. Okay. We are small. Use the grant as the class. Wrong. You need uh you need to use the class for program admin and fundraising, even if you are small. Penny, we don't have grants. That's fine. Well, then you won't need to track the third thing. Okay. Great refresher. Is this being archived? Yes, you'll get a recording. Anything, anybody else before we move on? All right, let's move on. Okay. So the first thing that I want to do is I want you to understand how to read your monthly financial statements. And I am kind of curious about this. I have a poll on this. Hold on. I kind of want to see who I'm talking to. So am I a, so I just set up a poll. Am I, this is you, are you an executive director or an employee or a board member or self-employed bookkeeper working on my own or an employee of an accounting firm or a CPA or an other? I'm just kind of curious to see. So we've got 254 people um, that are here, and we've got 75% of them have answered. I'll give it another few seconds here. Uh, if you don't see a poll at all, uh, then you can go ahead and put your answer in the chat. But most of you should see the poll. So I'm going to give it five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Now in the poll and share the results. And you can see 35% of you are executive directors and you're coming to this webinar. It makes sense trying to figure out how to read these things. Um, there are 16% um, of you are board members. Um, obviously, it's a good idea. And then the rest of you are employees, 42%. There's a very little that are other stuff. All right. So that helps me there. All right. So here we go. So how to read the monthly financial statements. So first of all, I want to tell you what you should be getting each month. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go to, all right where my reports are. And I'm using QuickBooks Online, but I don't have to explain to you because that is not what we're here for. You should be getting at least, you should be getting two, ideally three reports, okay? At least you should be getting the balance sheet and a profit and loss compared to budget every month. And if you're one of these boards that doesn't meet every month, maybe you meet every quarter, then it should be sent to you every month, okay? So I'm gonna click on balance sheet. Now, you should be getting a balance sheet that has the current year. This is three, this is June 30, 25, and put the prior year on it as well. I want both of those columns. And the reason why is because I can see last year I had 39,000 in the bank. On the same day, a year later, I have 83,000. So that kind of lets me know. And you might think, oh, wow, that's a good thing. Not necessarily. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain to you exactly what you need to be looking for when you look at this balance sheet. But let me just explain to you what the balance sheet is. For those of you that don't know, a balance sheet is a report that gives you a snapshot picture of what your organization looks like at a point in time. It doesn't have anything to, to say about what money came in or what money went out during the previous month. The balance sheet just as a snapshot, click. And it says, this is how much we have in assets, 129605 And this is how much we have in liabilities, 46127 And equity is simply the difference between the two. Okay? So I just, I, it's important you get this concept. The balance sheet is made up of a top half and a bottom half. The top half is all of the stuff of value that you had in your possession when the picture was taken. In this case, the picture was taken June 30, 25. Assets is all the stuff you have, 129,000. And then the bottom half, which always equals the top half, that's why it's called a balance sheet, because the top half, 129,605, 
equals the bottom half, 129,605. But the top half equals the bottom half. Top half is everything you have. Bottom part is made up of two parts. Liabilities, that's everything you owe. And then equity, that's simply the difference between the assets and the liabilities. So when you're looking at this balance sheet, the very first thing you want to do is you want to look at this and you want to say, okay, I have $129,000 of assets. That's good. Then you look down in the liabilities and you say, well, how much do we owe other people? We owe $46,000. Well, the difference between what we have, which is one twenty-nine. dollars and what we owe, which is 46, that's $83,000. So what that tells me is that I am $83,000 in the black. Basically, my organization is solvent. I have more money than I owe. Okay, well, not money. I have more assets than I owe. Okay, yes, you get a copy of the recording. Okay. All right. So um, I have a 20, 129,000, I owe 46, I'm left with 83. Another way of thinking about this is if I suddenly had to go out of business on June 30, 2025, I have $129,000 in assets. Well, I'd have to pay off $46,000 of bills. It looks like I have a loan I owe, I have some payroll taxes and some payables I owe. After that, that leaves me with 83,000 left over some of it will be in cash. Some of it will be in fixed assets. I may have to sell the fixed assets to get some money, or maybe I would just take the fixed assets and leftover cash and just give it to somebody else. Okay. So um, now the first thing that I want you to understand, I'm going to go back over here. I've listed it out here. These are the things you need to look for. You want to make sure you want to see if equity is a positive or a negative number. Now, you tell me, what do you think? Do you think equity should be a positive or a negative number? Mine is positive, 83,000. You want it positive or negative? Put it in the chat. I got you, Michael. Positive. Positive. Okay. I know some of you are noticing unrestricted negative uh, and unrestricted net assets. That's on pur purpose. I'll explain it in a second. Overall, you absolutely want 83,000. You want this to be a positive number. If this was a negative number, that would mean that you owed more than you had, which means you're like most of Americans in this country, but nevertheless, you would also be in real trouble. Okay. So you want this to be a positive number. Now, the other thing that you need to understand about the equity section and if yours isn't set up this way, you need training from me. But what we have here is we have our equity is broken up into unrestricted net assets, donor restricted net assets, and board designated. Okay. So what does this mean? What these mean is of this 83,000, we actually have $97,000 of, um, of, of income that we've received that's restricted, like grants that were given to you that are restricted and you haven't spent the grant dollars yet for the intended purpose, we have $97,000 of that. We also have $10,000 of money that the board has designated restricted, all right? So the total amount that we have is 107,000 of restricted dollars. But yet we only have 83,000 in total. So what this means, this is what this means. This means this organization has basically used some of their restricted dollars to pay for unrestricted purposes. That's why this is a negative and it happens all the time. All right. So if your bookkeeper knows what they're doing, they'll make adjustments to this account each month. So you'll be able to very quickly see we are underwater in terms of money that we can use for whatever it is we need. You see, we've got, and the funny thing is some of the assets that we have, 34,000 is in is in fixed assets. So we really only have cash of 85,000, receivables of six. So we got about $90,000 of either money or almost money. And we have 107 of stuff that's restricted. So we 
if if all of a sudden we were done, we wouldn't be able to even pay off all of our restrictions with cash. We'd have to sell some assets. <laughs> we're underwater here. Okay. So I'm going to stop for a second. Does anybody have any question about that? Where should an endowment fund or stocks appear on the balance sheet? An endowment fund is invested usually, so you'll have an asset for the investment, and then you'll have under equity the amount that is restricted because it's endowment, okay? Um, 3,100 is calculated from assets minus restricted. Yes. Well, what it is, is it's actually the total equity minus the restricted is what it is, Okay. Current assets are in CDs gaining interest. That's good. That's fine. I'm not so freaked out about that. The CDs more than a year. It's supposed to be in long term, but let's not go crazy. Okay. That is one thing I wanted to say to you too. I don't need your your the statements that you send to your board monthly. I don't need them to be gap based. Okay. But at the end of the year, I need them gap based if you're getting an audit done accordance with gap. But during the year, I'm not so freaked out about it, okay? Let's go back to get the list of things that I need you to understand um, when you're reading. First, is the equity positive or negative, and by how much? In this case, the equity is positive by 83000 but um, what's it in? Cash versus other assets. So then we can look and see, okay, well, We've got 83,000 in, in net assets minus liabilities. We got 93,000 or uh, in uh, current assets, about 90,000 in cash and receivables. So that's not bad. We're fairly liquid is what people say. Okay. Um, and let's see. Uh, we want to make sure that we have, like if all of this was in, receive, in in receivables or in equipment, we didn't have any cash at all, that might be a problem that we'd say we might have a cash flow problem. We know we're in the positive overall for the organization. Unfortunately, we're borrowing restricted dollars to pay for unrestricted expenses. So look for that. That's definitely something to uh, ask about. Restricted equity versus unrestricted, Okay unrestricted cash versus the annual operating budget. This is the last thing I want you to think about. When you see what the unrestricted amount is, we're underwater. We have zero, repeat, zero unrestricted cash, okay? Then what you wanna do is you wanna look at your annual budget. Say your annual budget is $500,000. Well, you should have three to six months of money in reserve, unrestricted cash that you can use to do whatever you want with. So 500,000 divided by, that's 125,000 a quarter. We have negative 33. This organization is not only living month to month, but they're borrowing restricted dollars to pay for unrestricted net assets. Okay. Um, uh, okay. Um, let's see, Karen, uh, I'm not quite sure about your question. We have to keep going. Um, how do you track restricted donations as an asset? You don't, track restricted donations as an asset, Debbie. You use the customer job field. I've got a two-hour webinar in it. We're also going to cover it in the three-day mini-series. I don't have time for that here. What's the best way to avoid restricted dollar misuse? Some The best way is to track your restricted net ass, uh, your restricted monies, and then um, do that Throughout the month, have a report that you can look at every single day, which we'll show you how to do in the three uh, the three uh, day training series. All right. The other thing is make sure that you raise unrestricted dollars. Please do that. OK, um, I have multiple clients that have uh, nonprofits whose goal is to help people overseas, like in Middle East and stuff like that. And. They have all of these different ways that you can give. Like when you go on the website, you can say, oh, I want my money to go for uh, the water program in Jordan, or I want it to go for, um, you know, education in um, Liberia or something like that. And they have all these programs and it's really cool for the donor. But what happens is nobody gives a donation that can be used to pay for overhead. And then you end up with no unrestricted donations. So please be careful of that on your websites. All right. Um, all right.
I like to add a little disclaimer on those websites saying 10% of this donation will go to cover overhead or something like that. So you have some money to pay for unrestricted donations. Okay. Uh, what do y'all think about what I'm talking about now? Is this of interest to you that I'm talking about how to change the website to get some unrestricted donations? Yeah, I think it's really helpful. Okay. I've had to do it for clients that I've audited. All right. So that is the balance sheet. Okay. You want to see whether you're in negative or positive land with equity and whether you're in negative or positive land with unrestricted net assets. Okay. That's your main thing right there. And I love comparing it to the prior year. I think that's really good. Okay. So the other report that you want to look at is the profit and loss. So let me pull up the profit and loss here. And by the way, if you're, if you're using, if you're on the board or something, or even executive director, and somebody else has your um, uh, has your QuickBooks file, you can add yourself as a user or they can add you as a user and give you reports only access. And you can look at this all day long, but not change anything. You could actually give every one of your board members access reports only user. And it doesn't limit it. There's an unlimited number of reports only users. You can have a thousand of them. Okay. Of course, then your board members would be bugging you all day with questions. So you probably don't want to do that. But um, anyway, you certainly could. Now, Let's see what we have here. So you, the second report you need to be looking at is your actual versus budget. Now, what I want to do is just kind of go over the things. You're probably used to looking at these, but I want to give you the things that I would look for. First, you want to see whether you have a net income or a net loss. Now, I do want to say that if you have a net loss um, so far this year, it doesn't mean that you're necessarily bad. You kind of want to look at it compared to your budget for the year. Okay. So I wouldn't freak out so much about that. And I don't think I want to spend a whole lot of time on the net income compared to budget. Cause I think that's something that most people will compare to, but I want to tell you what outsiders look at and what you should look at as a board member or as, as a executive director, you want to look at for diversified revenue sources. Okay. So this is what I mean. You want to look to see, how much of the income is coming from, first of all, gifted versus earned, okay? Gifted income is donations, either from individuals or from corporations or from foundations or from government grants. And you can see that most of this organization's money is coming from gifted sources. What is that? Out of 264, it looks like over 200 of it, maybe 230 is coming from gifts or grants. There's only about 17,000 that's coming from earned income. Earned income is I'm selling ticket sales or admission fees, or I'm selling, you know, trainings, or I'm selling tuitions or whatever. And that's only like 17. So the vast majority of this money is coming from donations. So that means this is not an organization that's extremely diversified, but it may be that you're not the type of organization that makes a lot of earned money. But you can see that almost all of the money is coming from either foundations or individuals. Now, that may be good or that may be bad. I wish there was earned revenue here. But again, an organization that's like a school or a theater certainly has earned income. But an organization that's just like helping the homeless probably doesn't have a lot of earned income, but at least within the gifted income, I'd like them to be diversified. The thing is, though, when I say diversified, I mean diversified in terms of the different line items, as well as how much individual people or grantors are giving, okay? So in other words, this 75000 is it made up of 300 donors? Or is it made up of five donors and one of them gave 75,000 bucks? Because that happens. I actually have a nonprofit that has had one donor that has been giving, she must give two or $300,000 every year to this organization. I really don't get it, to be completely honest with you. But the whole organization is resting on this woman's back. She passed away last year. And so now, I don't know what they're going to do. OK, you need to know that. Now, I'm not going to see if there's big donors here. So you want to ask. OK, so this organization 
not really very diversified in terms of earned versus unearned or gifted, but they do seem to get money from individuals, corporations, foundations, they're real foundation and individual heavy. But I would want to ask the executive director, who are our three top donors and how much have they given? Okay, that's not really going to be on the financials, but that's something that I think you need to ask. Um, somebody wanted to know what goes into here. Something you can't figure out where else to put it. Maybe like if you pay sales tax and the county gives you a little discount back, maybe you put it there, you know, stuff like that. Nothing major. Okay. Anyway, so that's your income. The main point is you want to make sure that you are diversified. All right. Um, are you too reliant on one entity for income? And you got to ask the executive director who are our biggest people. Okay. The other thing when it comes to expenses, okay, it's important to understand what our expenses are this year versus last and why they changed. But the bigger thing that funders look at, and you need to look at too, is you want to understand how much of the expenses are going for programmatic stuff versus overhead versus fundraising, okay? That is something that everyone needs to look at. When you look at a 990, I'm going to go to a 990. That's the information return that ta that um, that uh, nonprofits have to fill out. It's either a 990 or a 990 EZ, or sometimes if you have the postcard, then you don't really see anything on it. But um, I need to just pull up this 990 and show you. You see this page right here? It's a statement of expenses. And if you notice, it's like a spreadsheet. The rows are going to be the natural categories. Here's rent. It's called occupancy. Here's travel. Here's office expenses. Um, I'll scroll up here. Here is uh, salaries, payroll taxes. But if you look here, there's a column for program, a column for management, and a column for fundraising. And just so that you understand Programmatic expense means it's expense directly attributable to the program, and that includes a portion of salaries. So a program director, their whole salary will be a programmatic expense, whereas the executive director, only a portion of their salary will be programmatic expense. Same thing with the rent and the utilities on your office. That needs to be split as well. OK, now, ideally, they're doing this in QuickBooks and you're not relying on an accountant to do it at the end of the year. If you need to know how to do this, that's kind of what my training's for. But here is a P&L. We use the class feature for this and we can very easily see. And this is the third report. I don't know if you're getting this now, but maybe a finance committee could get this or certainly the executive director. This is a P&L, but it has a column. For each one of the programs, and then a column for admin and a column for fundraising, okay? So what we can see here is the total expenses for the guidance center are 119000 119000 uh, The synergy conference expenses are forty five or forty eight, and the AWARE campaign is 10708 so that's 178000 divided by 255,000 equals 70%. And I want it to be 75, okay? You want your expenses to be at least 75% of the total. That's what you would really want, okay? That's how people usually want to look at it. As a matter of fact, in QuickBooks Online, you can actually add that field for percentage. If I click, um, let's see, compare... I don't think compare another period. Customize. Uh, well, let's see. Customize. Where are rows and columns? Now, there used to be a... I thought I could add a percentage here. Does anybody remember how to do that? Um, ah, percentage of row right there. So we're going to click percentage of row right there. Click run report. And now it's going to add these percentages. So 46% of my expenses are for the guidance center, 18 are for the synergy conference, 4% are for the aware campaign, 21% are admin and fundraising is eight. Okay. So that's an easy way to figure out what those percentages are. Okay. Why 75% expenses? 
who the heck knows, Michael? It's just that a long time ago, people decided that nonprofits should be spending at least three quarters of their money on programs. That's why nobody will give money to nonprofits to get good administration or to raise more money. Some people in the nonprofit world think that's incredibly unfair. But as a donor, when you're thinking about giving money to help the children, you'd rather think that your money went to buy food than your money went to buy a subscription to QuickBooks Online. You know what I mean? Um, but anyway, enough of that. Um, okay. So I think that's it for the financial statements. Now what I want to do, um, but you should be looking at this stuff monthly, okay? So when it comes to the P&L, just to kind of summarize, again, you're looking for the income to be diversified and you're looking for the expenses to be going to program, okay? So I'm going to move on to the 990 now, okay? I want you to understand how to read the 990. And the reason why is because that's what you give grantors. Now, of course, this is an information return. It only happens once a year, but I thought I would give you a quick and dirty of what to look at when you're looking at your own 990. So now the reason why I care so much about a 990 is because that happens to be um, uh public information on GuideStar, all right? So um, let me go to wherever I have GuideStar here. Apparently, I've closed it, so let me go back over here. So uh, if you want to look at a 990, not just for you, but for any nonprofit in the world, uh, you can go, or in the United States anyway, you can go to GuideStar.org. You can sign up to be a member of this or to get an account. It's absolutely free. And then you can put, once you sign in, you can put the name of your nonprofit or any nonprofit, and you can look at your own or somebody else's 990, okay? Um, so tell me, um, somebody who's brave, all right? How many? We got 261 people. You want me to analyze your 990? Give me the name of your organization, just somebody, somebody who has a decent size organization, stick it in there. So Brandon's first, NetCare. So we're going to do NetCare. So I'm going to click search. Okay. And then is this it right here? Is this the right one? Whoever said NetCare. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and click on this. Now, look, he's not embarrassed at all. He's gold. So I'm going to click on this. And then show form 990. You can get this with the free version. Now, the last one up was 2022. They're a little behind the times here. It's not your fault. It's GuideStar's fault. Anyway, I'm going to zoom on this and make it a little bit bigger. And I'm going to give you some things to look up for this organization. Okay? So the first thing you want to do is you want to look to see how many members are on the governing body. In this case, there's 10. Okay? And uh, let me go to my slide so they can compare it to the slide. Yeah, you want to look at the number of board members. And the reason why I say this is because if you only have three board members and, oh, by the way, two of them are married, okay, <laughs> that ain't good. All right. So that's when you're just starting out, you want to have some third-party board members right out of the gate. They can be friends, but we need this number to be closer to at least five. All right. So that's the one thing, get board members. That's what they're going to look at. The second thing, I didn't put this on there. You look at number of volunteers. People love volunteers. So this is only 11. Now, I bet if you were to really think about it, you probably have a lot more than 11 volunteers, by the way. So I would look at this, okay? Because that's something that people look at. Now, the next thing that you want to do is you want to look at the P&L for both years. And you can see that right on the front page. You see in the prior year, they made $212,000, and that's in 21. And in the current year, they made minus 67. So they lost money. That's why I like having two years. Because, you know, sometimes you'll lose money in some years, you'll make money in other years. So it's nice to look at the two years next to each other. Now, I'm completely guessing, but my guess is the reason why they made more money in 21 is because they were probably getting a bunch of COVID money that year. So that's why their, uh, their contributions and grants are higher. I don't know if that's true or not. You can tell me. Um, Am I not sharing the screen? No, please share. Thanks. 
You're kidding me. No, it went away. The entire webinar? I've not been no, sharing No, no, no. You were sharing the screen. No, it was good. Just when you went to the 990. That's so weird. Okay. Oh, All wait right. a minute. Can Some people say they can see it. Okay. Can you see it now? Yeah. So. All right. Yeah. Well, let's go back. So here's the 990. This is where you want to put the voting members right there. There's 10. If you notice, there's only 11 volunteers. See, it's right on the front page of the return. We want this number as high as possible. Okay. And funders will look at that. And you need the board, the voters, you need at least five. I'm sorry. Okay. Otherwise, it looks lame. All right. This is our net income right on the first page. We had 212,000 this year, a minus 67 in the prior year. Okay. And you can also see whether your net assets are positive or negative right here on the very first page. Look at that. Very first page. Okay. So um, let's see what else I think they're going to look at. Um, page nine. I want to see if the revenue is diversified. Okay. Because a lot of times you're not giving them their your, um, your financials. You're giving them the tax return. Or maybe they're looking at it before they even talk to you. So we'll go to page five, which is where is page five? Um, uh, page three, four. You know, I think they changed the, hold on a second here. Oh, page nine, not page five. Okay, sorry. Okay, here's page page nine. So this is where the revenue is, and you'll be able to see what their gifted revenue is, which is fourteen million, which is their earned revenue here, which is three million. So that's a little better, not great, but still, it's probably good for them. All right. So uh, now you can see that they get almost no individual contributions. Almost all their money is coming from government grants. That's interesting. I don't know if that's good or bad or or not, okay? If you get the postcard, then you can't really use the postcard to determine anything. It's BS, okay? Um, all right. Uh, let's see. All right. Other people kind of see it the whole time, so I don't know what happened there. But anyway, all right. So um, I think that's the revenue. Look to see how it, it, it was diversified. Let me see what the other thing is I want you to look at. Make sure the program percentage is, you want it to be at least 75% of the total. And when you're getting this done, you could talk to whoever's doing the 990 or your audit, but let's see how to do it. 15,000, 15, 124, 859, divided by 18,085, 489. They're at 84%. That looks really good. Now notice, look at their fundraising column. According to this, they spend not one penny on fundraising. I don't buy that for a second, okay? <laughs> Somebody has convinced the auditor to leave that at zero. Uh -uh. Anytime you're even filling out a contract with the government or taking a donor out to lunch, you should at least put some salaries in this third column. So I'm crying foul on that one. But anyway, still, this looks really good, okay? Then... Um, we can look at the, uh, let's see the equity position. Okay. We already kind of talked about that on page 11. You can see it. Here's page 11. This is where you can see without donor restrictions is 4.2 million with donor restrictions is 78. Okay. So almost all of their money is unrestricted, which is great. So they got four million dollars in unrestricted net assets and we can see what their annual budget is just by looking at their total expenses is 18 million so four divided by 18 23 so they've got a quarter saved so they could go broke and still do all their work for at least three months without any income coming in at all okay so this is obviously a really strong organization okay um all right now, the other thing that you want to do is there is something called a Schedule A. And what this is, let me explain this to you for a second. So just look at me for a second. All right. In order for you to keep your tax-exempt status, they want to know that you're doing good, okay? Now, they don't have time, the IRS, 
they don't have time to come and monitor every nonprofit in this country. So what they decided was they're going to let the donors monitor it. And the way that they do that is they go, you know, if you got a nonprofit where a bunch of different people are giving donations or a bunch of different entities are giving donations, they're probably doing good work. Whereas if you have a nonprofit where there's only two or three people that are basically funding the whole thing, and maybe that person happens to be the brother of a vendor that's getting all the money, you know, then it starts to get kind of funky. So they want to know that most of your organizations are coming from the general public. So what they do in Schedule A, and everybody has to fill out a Schedule A, um, let's go to the Schedule A. Here's a Schedule A. What they do is they do a calculation over the last five years of all your money that you got in. Okay, here's 68000 that you got from the public. And then they want to know, you see this thing here? I'm going to zoom in on this to get a little bit bigger. The portion, the total portion of the contributions that exceeds 2% of the amount loan shown on line 11. Line 11 is all your support. It's all your income. So anybody that's given more than 2% of that, you're supposed to subtract it right here. In other words, all your big donors. Okay. Now this person doesn't really have any big donors uh, because you don't have to put in governmental entities. And so they get un unincluded because a government or a publicly supported organization is already kind of getting money from others. So they trust the government and they trust other nonprofits. But if there was individuals that were giving you a lot of money that exceeded 2%, they would put it there. Now, you don't really need to look at all of this. All you have to do is look at these percentages right down here. And this is saying almost all of their money is coming from the general public. Okay. So um, I think that might be the only other thing, yeah, that I needed to say about that. But I'm kind of having fun here. Let's look at one more nonprofit. I want to look at a small nonprofit. Somebody who's relatively small, uh, Get put your uh, account, your name in there. Uh, Port Angeles Food Bank. We'll do that one. Port Angeles Food Bank. All right, let's see what that is. Did I spell Angelus wrong? Yes. All right. There it is. It's still pretty big. I want something smaller than that. Um, positive bright start. Let's see what that is. Positive. Was it? Yeah, bright. Okay. Isn't this fun? You could do this all day long. All right. Okay, here's Positive Bright Start. Here's the 990. There it is. Ooh, they got theirs for 23, so that's been uploaded. Let me make this a little bit bigger. Okay. And let's see what they look like. So they got 20 volunteers. I'm wondering if we could make it any bigger. They got nine board members. That's okay. They made lost money this year, made a little money last year, so that's okay. They've got positive net equity there. Um, let's see. They're, um... Oh, this is one thing that's fun. <laughs> She's going to kill me. But one of the things that is public information, so you can't get mad at me about this, is that when you put your listings of directors, you have to have a list of directors you will always find the executive director here as well. You will find their salary. So you can always see what the executive directors are making. So if you work for a nonprofit, you could see what the executive director is making by just pulling up their 990. Um, let's see. Most of their money is coming from the government as well. Not very much money other than that. I'm not sure that they're very highly diversified. At least they have a decent chunk coming from tuitions. I wish they could get more revenue but there's probably a reason why it's mostly from the government that's something you would explain to funders you know um 1.599 so it's one six divided by one seven that's 95 percent. okay so that's pretty good so this person looks good as well um 
all of their money is unrestricted. They don't have any money, but they only have 174 in net assets, and their annual budget is a lot more than that. What's their annual budget? <laughs> You're probably like, maybe I shouldn't have had this show. Um, total expenses, $1.7 million. So their total expense is $1.7 million. Um, and let's see the balance sheet. They only have 121,000 in cash. Listen, they have no money to play with. You know what I'm saying? Like they need a cushion. They know they need a cushion, right? You're like, I know, Greg, stop telling people. Uh, but anyway, anybody can find this out. Okay. All right. So I'm going to, I'm going to move on to the audit for those of you that do get an audit. And I do have a, I do have a question on that because I'm kind of curious. Um, oh, I've been sharing this whole time. I wish somebody had told me that. Um, all right. Do you get an annual audit by a CPA? And I'm going to pull up an audit. So you see what I'm talking about. Um, where is my audit? Uh, my audit. Um, well, let's see. I'm looking to see where my. Oh, let me look at my downloads. Oh, it's here. Um, somebody said, no, they don't get an audit. And they kind of made it all caps because they're like, I don't want an audit. Listen, if you're going to be a nonprofit and you're going to like grow, kind of have to have an audit. You really kind of do. Um, there it is. Here's my synergy now audit. All right. Okay. So here's an audit. So basically, I just want you to point out how to read an audit. Now, the first thing you want to do when you get an audit, what it is, it means that an accountant has looked over the financial statements, the balance sheet, the P&L, and other stuff, and they've created an, a report. And if it's an audit, they've given a, an opinion on whether or not these numbers are accurate. And the opinion is in this letter here. So you want to look at this independent auditor's report and this very first sentence we have audited the financial statements of, okay, and this paragraph, the second one, in our opinion, the financial statements referred to present fairly in all material respects the financial position of synergy. That means we think these numbers are good, and this is what you want. And then you get the same deal. You get the P&L and the balance sheet. Here's the balance sheet, okay? These people have $10 million in assets. They only owe 450 plus 120. They only owe like 600. They've got 9 million of the 9 million without donor restrictions is 7.7 .7, and with donor restrictions is 1.6. So they've got a lot that's not restricted. Okay. And you can see they have a lot of cash too. So now a lot of what's, what's unrestricted is lots that they're, this is a habitat for humanity. A lot of this, the 4.5 million of this 7.7 .7 is not in cash, um, but they still have stuff. They have over four, they have $4 million in cash and they only have 1.6 million that's restricted. So they got money. They're good. All right. So, um, and there's your p &L. Again, you want to look to see, are they making money compared to last year or losing money? Are they diversified? Look at this. This is an audit that I actually did. So what I do is I take... The public support, which means money that they have gotten as a gift or a grant, that's 1.9. Whereas their earned revenue, this is from sales of homes and their restore, that's basically a store you can buy product if you're a construction person, that's 1.9. So they both are 1.9. So they're 50% earned and 50% gifted. So they're really diversified really well. Okay. Um, here is the expenses broken out so you can see how much is program, how much is admin, and how much is fundraising, okay? And then you just got a bunch of other stuff and a bunch of footnotes that I won't really go into. But I just wanted to show you that for the audit, 
um, if you get an audit, you're going to want to look at that as well. All right. Statement of financial position is the equity positive or negative by how much cash versus other assets, restricted equity versus unrestricted, unrestricted cash versus the operating budget. So um, now another thing that I need to go ahead and end the poll here, and you'll see just so you know, 60% of you get audits, 30%, 35% of you don't, and then 6% don't know. So I want to answer some questions for you. I want to open up the mic for Paige and see if there's any questions people have that we could answer. But before I do that, I do want you to know that if you like the way that I teach and you think that your organization could learn from me, if you go to quickbooksmadeeasy.com and you click on live webinars, your timing is perfect because next month, we have a three-day webinar series that's happening the 12th, 13th, and 14th for those that are using QuickBooks Desktop, which means those that are using this version right here. And for those of you uh, that are using the online edition, which is what I've been teaching with, it's 19, 20, and 21st. It's a three-day webinar series, two and a half hours a day. You get to it by going from quickbooksmadeeasy.com. It's normally $2.99 to go to all three days. Yes, you get the recordings. Yes, you get the slides. This is everything we're covering in day one, everything in day two, and everything in day three. Here's day three where we go over restricted grants, special fundraising events, thank you letters, year and donor acknowledgments, and kind contributions. It's huge. It's kind of like the basics and advanced for every, it's everything you'd need to know if you're a nonprofit using QuickBooks Online. Or desktop, okay? So it's two ninety nine normally. We are going to give it to you at a discount. Uh, here is the discount code: TechSoups. That's T S forty off. T S forty off. T S forty O F F. All right. So this this is only available until this weekend. Um. Saturday night at 11.59 p.m., this $40 off, and then it's $2.59 for the three days. All right? So, um, all right. How much is a typical audit? It depends, Jen. You know, the lowest that I'll charge for an audit, and I'm more on the inexpensive side, is $8,000 for the year. I've seen them go as high as twenty. Okay? So it depends upon how complicated your books are. Who else has a question for me? Put it in the chat. Who else has a question? Stick it in the chat. And then Paige, if you want to come off the line and just say something at any point, that's perfectly fine with me. Uh, anything you want to say, Paige? Uh, just most of the questions are related to audit at this point. I think you definitely piqued an interest. Um, okay. So we might just uh, look at some of those. But I'll ten, leave that to you, auditor. Ten, thank you. 10000 a year is, I need to see, but 10000 a year is not unreasonable. Um uh, let's see, can program service income count as public support? No. Um, do you have to be a beginner for this training? No. The training is also for people that have been using it for years. Uh, do you do audits in other we, I, I don't know what we, I means. We do audits all over the country, Mary, if that's what you're asking. Maybe we eyes Wisconsin. What's the best way to track total compensation for employees in QuickBooks and for benefits invoices that are a lump fee? That's a course, okay? Not something I can teach here. I've tried reaching out for an audit without success. What's the best way to reach out? In other words, you can't find an auditor, Karen? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, there's a real hard time finding people that are due it this way. If you check with your state society of um, uh, nonprofits, you might be able to find somebody. Um, the average cost of a 990. Oh, that is the last question I will ask you. Um, a 990, we charge around 1200 for. And the difference between doing a 990 and a 990 easy is nothing. So for us, it's the same amount of work. All right. I don't do single audits, but I do have a question. If you are interested in getting just a 990 done, and there was an offering on TechSoup that allowed you to get it at a discounted rate through us, either under 50,000, we do your postcard and registration, or over 50,000, we just do the 990, 
Would y'all have an interest in getting that through TechSoup? How do you feel about that? Give me a yes or a no. Because I feel like there's such a need for this. All right, cool. Um, yes, um, we don't. I don't do a walkthrough of completing a 990, but I do sit down with the person afterwards um, and go over the 990 with them. Okay. Uh, Karen has a CPA who's the treasurer. Yeah, they would have a, a no tech soup doesn't have a discounted rate for an audit at this point, Emma. Okay. All right. So I think I'm going to turn it back over to Aretha and I'm going to keep this up on the screen. Please come to the three day training if you haven't already done it. It's awesome. We'll play music. We have fun. Um, and Aretha, um, I'm going to let you uh, take us out real quick and I'm going to play another song at the very end just so that they have something to listen to. Awesome. Thank you so much, Greg, Paige, and Bill in the background. You'll get the recording and the slides later today. Thank you 